Okay, so today we're going to be talking about emergency management of acute pulmonary edema. And this is going to be the first of a series of emergency management of a, a bunch of conditions that can present with acute shortness of breath. So it's a very common emergency that can, it doesn't have to occur in the middle of the night, but it can, it can occur in the middle of the night and it can present over a few minutes with severe breathlessness, coughing, frothy, pink, bloodstained sputum, orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So when you have pulmonary edema fluid inside your lungs, um, in specific, when you have something like left ventricular failure, your fluid starts to back into your lung pulmonary system. First, it begins with the fluid going into your interstitial spaces. And if it gets severe enough, it can start to present into the lungs, the alveoli. And this is when you can cough up this pink bloodstained sputum. Of course, when you are lying flat, this is going to make the shortness of breath a lot worse. Um, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is when patients report this acute shortness of breath while, when they sleep and they often wake up gasping for air. Now, fluid overload does not necessarily have to be with acute pulmonary edema. Sure, if pulmonary edema continues to the point where it backs into the systemic circulation and you get pitting edema in your legs, um, your <clears throat> liver gets congested, you get ascites and fluid in your abdominal cavity, yes, for sure that can happen. But in just acute pulmonary edema in the acute setting, you're just gonna have that left ventricular failure with fluid in your lungs. Fluid overload is more associated with congestive heart failure when your left and right ventricle um, starts to fail and the fluid starts to enter the systemic circulation. So an X-ray is very good at identifying um, pulmonary edema. And a best way to identify it is a, a few signs that we look for. So here we can first of all see that the heart is by far enlarged, very large heart. Usually we want this um, distance um, to be less than 50% of the chest wall. Now we can see in the base of the lungs, there seems to be blunted costophrenic angles. Um, identifying that there's a pleural effusion, um, so a fluid within the pleural cavities that seems to be present. Um, and it can be seen by the meniscal sign as well. Um, and there are curly A and B lines. Curly A line seems to be more ragged um, and a bit more slanted. Curly B lines tend to be more straight. Um, and this is can be hard to identify in a chest X-ray, but these identify fluids um, within the um, interlobar septums um, is my understanding of it, but can be very difficult to identify. And there's a lot more features that are more pronounced in acute pulmonary edema. Peribronchial cuffing is also another small sign that we might identify and it identifies when there's excess mucus or sputum. So mucus is not in this setting. That's why it's not really a specific sign. It's a non-specific sign. But if there's a lot of fluid, it can cause a small part of the lung to collapse, um, making the bronchus a bit more prominent. Um, so that's why the, the middle section is quite black in color. Um, again, a non-specific sign. Other non-specific sign is upper vascular distribution. So your left atria um, collects collects all the pulmonary veins to then um, that are rich in oxygen to distribute to the systemic circulation. But in left ventricular failure, it can cause the left atria to be distended and causing uh, causing engorgement of all these pulmonary veins that appear right here. So it's a common place to identify upper lobe distribution. And of course, the most prominent sign in this chest x-ray is this patchy opacities, um, this fluffy patch opacities um, that are present 
in somewhat a bat wing pattern. Usually it doesn't really look like a bat wing, but I guess you can try to make it out to be, but really it's this fluffy patch, patchy opacities that quite tend to be very central um, and bilateral in origin. Now, we definitely need to talk about oxygen because we're going to have to give them oxygen uh, most of the time, especially when they're hypoxic and short of breath. And there's a few ways we can deliver this. We can go through our nasal cannula. It look like this. These fits into your nose. The simple face mask. Um, then there is a face tent, but it's not mentioned here. Then we can step up to the Venturi mask um, and then adapter that's usually chosen to connect with it. There's a non-rebreather mask with a bag attached to it. And then there's high flow nasal oxygen. And then the step up from this would be a non-invasive um, ventilation, which is BiPAP or CPAP. Um, the most important thing to kind of recognize from these is that all of them have very different flow rates. Um, and it's um, good to choose select these based on the pr presentation. Usually with someone with this kind of shortness of breath, um, with no history of COPD, just pulmonary edema, it might be good to start off with a non-rebreather mask to start off with, um, and then stepping down or stepping up based on their improvement. So managing acute pulmonary edema. It used to be an old mnemonic called LMNOP, Lasex, Morphine, Nitroglycerine, Oxygen, Position, or Plagotomy. But the morphine aspect has not really been recommended now because of its increased link to um, mortality and increased use of ventilation. So therefore, that now the current mnemonic is called POND. So position and plus or minus, um, we're going to give them oxygen or posi um, positive pressure ventilation, oxygen, nitroglycerin, diuretics. Let's step on through with on how to actually give this and how it actually looks like in a real setting. So you walk in, you suspect they have acute pulmonary edema, the chat, and they're gasping for breath. Based on their history and the examination you've collected, it sounds very typical of um, acute pulmonary edema. So you're going to have to organize a chest X-ray. While you do that, you're going to immediately sit the patient up. Um, and provide them some high flow oxygen via reservoir mask or the non-rebreather mask, aiming to give them saturations above 95% um, if they are not have a history of COPD. Now, yeah, they have a lot of fluids and crackles around the lungs. Let's start to decrease the preload um, and allow, um, um, allow the lungs to reduce some of that fluid and allow the heart to work a bit better. And we do that by giving GTN, making sure that you check the blood pressure before giving GDN, because GTN can drop the blood pressure. And that's exactly how we're trying to make it work. We're gonna decrease the preload and allow the heart to um, pump more efficiently. So we're gonna give 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 milligrams sublingually and repeat after five minutes if the blood pressure is still um, above 100 systolic. Um, and then we can consider a GTN infusion um, initially at a one mil per hour rate, and you can double the rate every five minutes, titrating it to the um, blood pressure. Now, if they're systemically overloaded, so they have pitting edema as well, and you know, have signs of congestive heart failure, then let's give them 40 milligrams of IV frusamide. Uh, I didn't write frusamide here. Or you can double their usual dose if they're already on it. Now, let's say they're not responding to these measures. You've given the, you've given the oxygen, you've given GTN, and you've given even furosemide. Now, the, they're still hypoxic, still short of breath, very distressed. Now, it's time to escalate our oxygen delivery. We're going to now use CPAP. So CPAP is positive pressure ventilation, and BiPAP uses inspiration and expiration. CPAP is very... Um, good for things like obstructive sleep apnea and good for pulmonary edema. Um, so it's CPAP is usually given for type one respiratory failures, while BiPAP is given more for type two respiratory failures, just in general terms. Um, you can see a bit of mix up as well. Um, so initially we can start with 10 um, of PEEP. Um, so 
peak expiratory oh i've forgotten what it stands for again so peep stands for positive and expiratory pressure um, and that's all set our initial setting of the CPAP to. And then we have to be careful of the side effect of hypotension because you're giving a lot of pressure inside your lungs, which can then decrease the venous return to the heart. And that can drop effectively drop your blood pressure. Now we're going to wean this CPAP based on the improvement um, as well. If they're hypotensive, you're going to treat them as cardiogenic shock and it's not nor it's not abnormal to have intubation as part of the process. Now, once they're stabilized, let's try, we need to find out what actually is causing this acute pulmonary um, edema. And when we're talking about left ventricular failure, there's six major causes. It's ischemic heart disease, hypertension, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathy, pericardial disease, and congenital heart disease. And as you can see, the very cardio, um, cardio causes of left ventricular failure. And then there can be things that precipitate acute pulmonary edema. So things that we commonly see is maybe they're not compliant with their diet or their medication. They're eating a lot of salt rich diet. They um, have not been taking their fluid tablets and they've presented with acute pulmonary edema. Maybe we, there, there has been too much fluid given on the wards. So it's really important to check their fluid balance to make sure that the input and output is okay. Making sure that maybe they, are they still sticking to the 1.2 um, liter restriction for people with um, heart failure. In terms of other, other things, we need to think about if there's any recent medications that's been introduced, um, such as beta blockers or calcium channel blockers that can depress the heart. And then there can be some pathological causes as well. So things like acute coronary syndrome. So MI, is there an arrhythmia? Then you can think about the lungs. Is there a fever or an infection that could be going on? It doesn't have to be a pulmonary infection. It could be an infection anywhere. In terms of the lungs, we need to really rule out a PE, which can cause pulmonary hypertension. Um, and, and it can cause um, acute pulmonary edema. You need to think if there's any acute kidney injuries that could have occurred um, and that has led to fluid overload or possibly anemia as well. So that is the end of acute immediate management of pulmonary edema. Um, we'll work through some other causes as well in the upcoming session. So thank you. Please like and subscribe and comment down on what you want to hear next. And yeah, I'll see you guys later.